getting a sense of the place of where you're going to go and report from, you really need to to sort of know it. And and it's hard to put into words, but you'll never really know it until you're in in a place, you know, and you're trying to pay your water bill and you're buying groceries and you're chatting to locals and you have neighbors and you make friends and you got to get under the skin of a place, you know, because otherwise you fly in, you cover a crisis, you don't cover a country. Ladies, gentlemen, everybody, welcome back to Media Voices. We are the B2B media outlet that focuses on everything to do with the business of journalism. I'm Chris Sutcliffe. I'm Esther Thorpe. And I'm Peter Houston. And that clip you just heard was from Jane Ferguson, an award-winning journalist with a huge amount of experience covering wars and conflicts the world over. We spoke about how wars often bring the issues around modern journalism, those of mistrust, disinformation and lack of resources, into the starkest possible focus, and how the democratisation and how the democratization of tech is making the job of journalists covering wars both easier and more difficult. Really, really interesting chat. But speaking of those perennial issues, we talk about them every single day of the working week in our newsletter, which you can get by going to voices.media and signing up. Now, that has the four most important stories of the day. And we'd really appreciate it if you took the time to get to know us through our newsletter. <laughs> get to know us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one of the things that if you've worked in media for any amount of time, you will know all too intimately is the fractious and contentious relationship between Google and the media. Now, Peter, why are we talking about that this week specifically? Oh, there's been all sorts going on. Um, well, the real the real trigger, I suppose, was this thing in France where they've, the French autorité has slapped a $270 million fine on Google for training its barred AI, which I think is now called Gemini, which is a better name, really. Isn't it, it is, yeah, yeah. Gemini is better than Bart. Well done, Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've slapped this fine on them for training Gemini without notifying the copyright holders of the content that they're training it on, which is, for a large part, the publishers and the agencies. I mean, that's just, just an ongoing saga in France, right? They yeah. find them, I don't know what it was, $590 million in 2021. And that's the thing, this this case wasn't even about the the generative AI and the, and the copyright. This this was actually about all the stuff that was going on earlier with the snippets and the and the link tax and everything else. And they've just been like, oh, well, also on top of that, we're just going to fine you for this. So the fact that they can do that before there's even a big proper case gone around it is... Um, it's not great for Google at the moment. If you, if your data, if your content is being used to train a large language model from somewhere like Google or you know from OpenAI or whatever, absolutely, you deserve recompense. Now that doesn't mean that just publishers, just these publishers in France, should be getting recompense. It's everybody whose content is being used. So I think that's one problem. But also, yeah, conflating it with an existing thing about snippets just seems to me to muddy the waters. It's a completely different thing. Well, it's not though, is it? It's all. We don't know how to fix this problem with Google. Well, it's all the same, yeah, exactly. It's all the same motivation, but the actual details and the actual tech behind it is entirely different. It's definitely like peeling an onion. Yeah, uh, or I mean, going down a rabbit hole, or I don't know, whatever, whatever euphemism. <laughs> for there's going to be a French euphemism for it. Yeah. Oh, I wonder what the French for peeling an onion is. <laughs> oh, I suppose the other thing here is that, like, Google aren't the only ones or the earliest ones to have trained their generative AI products on publisher content. So <laughs> are France going over, um, are they going to go after OpenAI? Are they going to go after Microsoft? I mean, they're, they're better because, you know, they've set the precedent now, but to use another <laughs> and this is a massive can of worms. Oh, my God, I can't look that up as well. <laughs> I've just, just found what follow the rubber hole is in French. It's on about Lupin. It is, yeah. Le terrier du lapin. Mm, nice one. Thanks. Um, oh, that's where Terrier comes from, of course. To follow. This is welcome to language lessons with media voices as well. <laughs> Come for Google, stay for the French. <laughs> so, I suppose the question then is: Do we think that this is uh, our slap? Basically, what is a slap on the wrist? Is that going to be enough mm, to fine. discourage them from doing this elsewhere? Do you ever play that game where you we call it slapsies? So basically, you hold your hands together oh, like yeah, you're yeah. praying, yeah. and you hold them against each other, and you have to slap each other's hands. Yeah. 
And one slap on the hand doesn't much. But see, when you've been doing that for 10 minutes, your hands are really frigging sore. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, there's so much targeted at Google at the moment. You know, they've got this antitrust suit coming in September, which is like billions. Yeah. And then there's the French going after them. And then, you know, it's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, so yeah, it's a slap on the wrist, but geez, money man, you think that there's some well, there's, there's a lot of slaps in this ruling because they've they've sanctioned them for like a whole host of issues. Things like how it relate, how it's been negotiating with French news publishers, um, saying it, it didn't provide them with all the information they needed to ensure fair bargaining. There's a huge thing about um, not allowing them to opt out of the AI training models. Yeah. There's just there's just a huge, we'll, we'll link to the TechCrunch article, but there's just a huge list of things that Google have been fined for, and Google have basically just been like, well, we're going to appeal. But I don't think they did really... appeal this one, did they? I think they just settled this one because it's relatively small. <laughs> just, you know, just a nice little $270 million. I'm not going to say monopolistic. That's for the Department of Justice to argue but they are so dominant within the search space they are so dominant within kind of the you know the provision for enterprise tech and everything that publishers do use that you can argue credibly that they should be broken up you can argue credibly publishers should be paid if their content is used to train uh, ai models which then deliver significant value back to google you can't argue for the link tax you can't argue that you should get direct payments that's disingenuous as we've said so there's ricky sutton who we had on as a big noises guest it's probably, and I, I think Ricky would say this, would agree with us. He's probably at the extreme end of the Google resistance, as he would see it. You can't tell from the tone of the article that, <laughs> that <laughs> we wrote, will link to. So he, he wrote, he just wrote, that, I think it was about a week ago, uh, he wrote this thing and it's called, you know what, let's just blow Google up and go after their ad gold. And it's full on, but what was interesting I mean, there's loads that's interesting in that as well, worth a read. But what was interesting was the way he started it, he talked to a publisher, and the publisher was like, well, yeah, we rely on Google. We Our ads are on Google, our emails on Google, our documents, our spreadsheets, our slide decks, data's all on Google. And then there's stuff like the Google News Initiative, you know, which pays for staff. It, mm. we, we have benefited directly from that through Google's sponsorship of a podcast series. Yeah. So there's all this stuff that's tying publishers into Google in a good way. It's the fact that there's all this other stuff which you just have no control of once you're in that ecosystem, whether it's advertising or email. This has been going on for a long time. That that I was going to say reliance. Maybe that's the wrong one. But Symbiotic relation. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's been gone for a really, really long time. And I think part of the issue is no one's really been paying that much attention. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, our whole business is is reliant. It's the same thing that happened with traffic on Facebook. No, it's not the same thing, which oh. ties really nicely into our next story. So um, the INMA, they did a media subscription summit um, a couple of weeks back, and um, they put this post up about what, well, what is actually happening to the money around generative AI search. And one of the things that we always forget when we're talking about this sort of thing, and I don't know why we forget, because Madhav Chinyapa, who was the head of news, uh, head of news ecosystem at Google um, a couple of years back, he spoke to us in 2019, and he said, Google is just as dependent on quality content, whether that's from publishers, people, whatever, mm-hmm. as they are on Google. And that's not the case with Facebook. Facebook can remove news, publish- like publishing products from its platform and Nobody cares. There's enough idiots posting memes to to keep interest going. Um, That's so cynical. (laughs) Google is reliant on keeping the ecosystem of a high quality. And you can see how hard it's come down on possibly a little later than it could have done. (laughs) The proliferation of the the AI spam sites, which, what was it, like last month it released a huge update that was sort of squashing public quote publications that was putting out like thousands of articles a day and it's saying no like we we will completely lose our our market position you know there, there is no future for google if the future of google search is just ai generated results i've got uh, so mad, mad i've actually said that um the tech giant is is really selfishly incentivized to want the news ecosystem to thrive because if they thrive and they make more money google makes more money and this this piece from I, the INMA said that it, 
Google bought in it was thirty one billion dollars in revenue in twenty twenty three from its ad network on just publisher websites. So at the moment, in the short term, they're not going to make moves that will lose them the share of that kind of money. And it's it's about the longer term future here that they they are incentivized to try and keep things high quality. Yes, but they switched all the shit off in France. At the beginning of this whole thing in France, I don't know when that was, 2019. Was that hardball? Was that them playing mm. some sexy hardball with uh with Ooh, sexy hardball. <laughs> in in small select markets, they've still France! Not done, they're still not, they're, they're still not done so God, in Canada. That's such an Anglo-centric view of the world, that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. They're a home <laughs> counties view of the global information ecosystem but it was it was only google news they switched off in france and then because they did the same thing in spain a couple of like back in 2014 it was just google news they switched off they didn't remove publisher links from search which is what they were threatening to do in canada and never actually went through with i i, also, this- I think sometimes we get caught up in our own importance because people use google to find freaking restaurants and new shoes and bikes and directions well, you know yeah, we're not I- we're not the only game in town now and i think that's where we're going to see Jenny AI really start to Jenny. You know, come to the fore. <laughs> Jenny AI, yeah. That's where we're going to start seeing um, Jennifer AI really come into its own for Google because they have the tech to do that. They have the tech to effectively cut out the uh, the middleman in terms of e-commerce with that. So that's going to hit some publishers more than others. I mean, it's interesting that you use that phrase cut out the middleman because one of the options that has been put up as part of the resistance <laughs> Uh, it was the Enma Media Subscription Summit, and there was a presentation from uh, Professor Raj Kumar Venkatesan, who specialises in marketing and technology. Yeah, I think he's at the University of Virginia. And one of the things that he suggested was this idea of removing the middle one, and he drew parallels with the travel industry, where you get a better deal if you go direct to the mm. the, the travel providers. Or I guess there's things like Booking.com. Other travel booking sites are available. So that idea of taking out the middleman, if the middleman is Google, that's a hard word to say, isn't it? Middleman? Middleman, yeah. (laughs) If you say it too many times. What? Michael Keaton appears in a striped suit. (laughs) (laughs) Working on a a sponsor podcast now about using AI to bring... um, small businesses into the publisher ecosystem so that kind of contextual stuff so mm. it's not impossible it's the issue here that we've identified the fact that the symbiosis has become almost too symbiotic symbiotic <laughs> yeah. well, I, mean, I, that- I think this is this is part of the issue that, that google i can imagine is facing internally is that you've it, it's got this you know it needs it needs the quality search results it needs the quality ecosystem but you've got its competitors that aren't relying on that in quite such a big way because they're not half as dominant <laughs> open ai and, and chat gpt if they start being better at providing i'm not going to say search if they provide answers to people google google will lose its market dominance at which point it doesn't matter how much it needs publishers it, it, it that becomes irrelevant so they've kind of got those pressures of like they need to innovate they need to be better they need to make a good search product that serves the purpose and that ne- doesn't necessarily involve publishers so what we're, we're, we're thinking that google could re- be replaced in search the way google replaced yahoo and AOL, really? yeah. okay so ursula Le Guin, author earthsea fantastic author lathe of heaven loads said we live in capitalism its power seems inescapable so did the divine right of kings i can't see you know i can see foresee a future where google is no longer you know we we're already seeing a little bit of movement on that with Amazon coming in and stealing some of its lunch money. Well, there was that, that's, that that's, bizarre that's, thing a couple of years ago, isn't there, where people are like, oh, everybody's using TikTok to search for restaurant recommendations. That is, that is definitely but the case. But then TikTok might be banned by the end of the year, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> that's a different thing, though, aren't it? That's context again. You can provide broader, deeper context with a personality and with a trusted brand environment that any search, particularly AI-driven search, just can't do. This leads me so beautifully onto a quote from Ian Beckett, which is appearing <laughs> is that like in a two piece... proper full-on segues I've managed <laughs> I'm to do. Sure I'm well. um, So we've, we've got a post um, from a media consultant Ian Beckett going live on the site uh, on Tuesday. That's the day after. To, no, that's tomorrow if you're listening to the podcast on Monday. Um, all about uh, how like how you can approach AI implementation as a leader in your business. But he he talked about this quite a lot where he said. Um, 
there's going to be a huge issue with the publishers that created easily replicable content. And he said, you know, if you're a company with a thousand employees, what is your competitive advantage over the one person who can do that every week using Gen AI? And if the answer is you haven't got a competitive advantage, you need to rethink your content strategy because that is not a viable business. The other thing to that is talk, just thinking about viable business models. Suing people isn't a viable business model. Terry bridge has got a great quote about, you know, we're all in the same boat. We may try and push each other over the sides, but only a madman would hack away at the planks that keep it afloat. <laughs> and suing just seems like exactly yeah. that. Perfect. That is a great quote. That's better than the Ursula Gwynn quote. <laughs> I mean, I think, and I, 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 that is exactly what Ricky Sutton is suggesting. He's talking about blowing this shit up, and you know, people will benefit from the chaos. I don't know. That doesn't sound like a business strategy I'd like to be part of. This week, I spoke to Jane Ferguson, an award-winning journalist who, after graduating from J-School, moved to the Middle East to be a freelance reporter. Since then, she's covered on the ground the Arab Spring and its subsequent conflicts, in addition to the wars in Afghanistan and now in Gaza. So we spoke about why she's hopeful that tech will empower a new generation of free agent journalists, and what lessons she's taken from years covering conflicts about the role of journalism in shining a light on the fog of war. But I began by asking her about those formative years when she went freelance. Sure. Um, my name is Jane Ferguson. I, uh, cur- you know, I've, I've most recently been a, a special correspondent for PBS NewsHour. I contribute to the New Yorker. Essentially, I've been a foreign correspondent for for my whole career, uh, mm. mostly working in TV and living and working in the Middle East, East Africa, South Asia. So I've really been working in broadcasting, and really in the last eight years, my passion has been magazine-length TV reporting. So uh, certainly in, in public broadcasting, working on extended in-depth reports, kind of like mini docs. And but I love to write too. Um, I wrote a book last year that, or well, it came out last year, um, which is a memoir, which is really about you know a number of things and growing up in Northern Ireland and becoming a journalist, but really about what it's like to be in in the in the TV news industry and kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly of war reporting. So, um, <laughs> See, this that is fantastic. I mean, that could be an entire episode in and of itself, kind of your journey mm-hmm. from Northern Ireland and through journalism to sort of where you are now. I said you've seen all aspects there of of coverage yeah. of conflicts and everything. I just wondered over the course of your time then in the industry, how have you seen that aspect of journalism change and evolve as we've seen tech advances, as we've seen changes in the the relationship between the press and the public? The changes are massive. Um, mm. It's been about fifteen years since I really first moved to the Middle East. I was straight out of college. I you know I was part of that first wave of freelancers. And I. Don't get me wrong, people have been freelance journalisting for a long, long, long time, but it was really the financial crisis that hit my generation. We came out of college, uh, I was year year of 07, mm. and fell on our faces and couldn't get jobs because like, the, the journalism industry had collapsed almost. Like, I mean, it was especially in the UK, it was so bad. I was coming out of college in England, and there was no jobs to be had. And those of us who didn't want to do anything else and didn't want to you know, give up, went off and freelanced. And... You know, bounced around a lot. I remember my 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 best friend in college. Her, she was the editor in chief of the student newspaper, and I worked mm. at the paper too. And she went off to Mexico and freelanced. Now she works in West Africa for the New York Times. And and I went off to the Middle East and bounced around. Um, and eventually became one of those one man band TV journalists. And then the Arab Spring happened, and there was a huge demand for for overseas news, especially in the Middle East. Um, and so that really changed things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the Arab Spring turned into to, to some pretty brutal wars, especially in, in, in Syria. Mm. And, you know, technology made a lot of that possible. My a, a huge amount of my work has been not traveling on the road with massive teams of people, but actually, you know, traveling with very, very light, maybe with one other team member flying in and then hiring and working with brilliant local journalists that's been a, that's been a big change too and then obviously like the media landscape has changed you know podcasting is huge there's there's more of an opportunity for for people to go freelance and and make it on their own so i mean god you've queued up so many different things there to begin with what is that changed relationship between the journalists who exist in the countries who you know you're going out to cover and the rest of the world's press the concept that we necessarily need uh you know a foreigner to fly in 
Um, I think there's always going to be a, a, there's always going to be a, a, a hunger for people who know their audience, you know, mm. who kind of come from the community to whom the story is being told. Because there's a there is a storytelling element to that, you know. If you know the public where you're coming from, that's important. But there's so much add, add um, you know, value add to someone coming from that country. And in the past, you know, there was a concept. There was also kind of especially in TV, there was a concept that like accents were an issue and, 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 and the, the journalist has to look like the person that's, yeah. that's watching the story. I think that's largely being debunked. Um, and so thankfully we're starting to see more of a mix. I think also in other countries that I've been lucky enough to work in, we've seen this incredibly educated young population rise up. Many of them are ultra connected to the world. Many of them speak English. Um, Many of them want to be journalists, uh, you know, starting to fill bureaus and get more of a chance to get on air and get their bylines out there. I mean, it's really just starting to, to get to the levels it needs to be at. But I think we're seeing that a lot more. Um, I think one of the heartbreaking things about Afghanistan, uh, as it sort of fell under the Taliban, was the pre-Taliban. I mean, Afghanistan had this enormous local media, you know, like t- t- I, we, I did, we did a ton of stories at PBS about amazing Afghan journalists who, who mm. were like household names, massive stars in Afghanistan on national TV. I was lucky enough in my early years as a journalist to spend a few years at Al Jazeera English, which is truly the most diverse newsroom on the planet. And no one's terribly impressed by the fact that you've lived in Dubai and you've got some broken Arabic when you show up in that newsroom. You know what I mean? Like they hire the best of the best from Kenya and from Pakistan and from, and so there's a real sense where, you know, the diversity there, it's not performative. Like you're playing with the big boys now. And so I loved that. I worked in bureaus where all like everyone in the bureau, except for me was, from Afghanistan or from Kenya. And so that gave that that really, really hit home how um how working with fantastic homegrown talent is really it's really kind of the secret sauce and that's where where much of news is headed. One thing you mentioned before is this idea that, you know, with the rise of platforms like Substack and some social platforms, it's allowing people to, to kind of tell the stories direct to an audience without necessarily mm-hmm. the need to be part of a wider news organization. Yeah. To what extent do you feel like that, in addition to some of the trends you've already mentioned, is going to be the future of kind of conflict reporting. It, it absolutely is the future. And this is where technology really empowers the, the storytellers beyond the behemoth news organizations. You know, it's mm. pretty amazing. And if we're, if we're lucky or if we do it right, then we can democratize news in a way that's, that's going to be pretty extraordinary. I mean, that's going to uproot so many of the kind of traditions and even the kind of the power structure within the news industry. So that's going to be a a huge upheaval. Um, I wanted them, but obviously technology isn't in and of itself a solution. We've seen, you know, uh, services shut down in some countries. We've seen actual internet availability very, very limited in some places. Absolutely. And, And we see that in places like you know, front of mind right now is somewhere like Iran, mm. where with the, with the female-led protests, you know, trying to get hold of women, um, they, you know, you know, we're, we're reliant on them having a VPN and then an incredibly slow, that slows their internet down even more. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, governments will just slow the internet, you know, which yeah. is a pretty crude, blunt instrument. It's not a particularly high tech, um, but, you know, it's not that easy for governments really to prevent people talking. You know, we now we got signal and we've got um, you know, I mean WhatsApp isn't particularly secure, but like, you know, things like like signal are are, are incredibly helpful. Um, you know, there's just there's with and also everybody having a phone, it's very, very hard to keep secrets. It's just incredibly difficult. I mean, look at what's going on in Gaza. International journalists banned from Gaza. Is there any shortage of footage? You know, I mean, now it, there's less and less because of, of how many journalists have been killed. Um, and that's that's awful. But but even with that, we still see footage out. Um, and, and so I'm hopeful that that it's 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 increasingly difficult for uh, you know governments to 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 block information, yeah. the difficulty is when they use technology to spy on reporters, and that's the harder part when it comes to our security, especially local journalists. You know, um, that's 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 going to be that's going to be front and center, um, you know, of mind for for reporters mm. going forward. 
Yeah, 100%. And that's actually flagged up another couple of things. One is, I think there's a story in the Washington Post today about how they actually got some drone footage out from Gaza. They'd actually managed to smuggle that out through the border, like to your point. And, and I was in Syria in those really early days in Homs City. It was actually the first journalist for, that Al Jazeera sent in to the rebel-held mm. areas in, 20, in early, early 2012. And what the rebels were doing, and I, this is 12 years ago, they were... You know, just on regular phones, they were swapping out uh, SIM cards constantly. So even if they were followed, it was very hard for regimes to catch them that quickly. And we did the same thing whenever we would go to, to Afghanistan and we'd want to go access Taliban controlled areas. We wanted to make sure that, you know, the, the intelligence services of Afghanistan, you know, um, who, who are, you know, g- made capable by the CIA would not be able to follow us mm. into uh, these areas. So, you know, we would often just toss SIM cards out the window, put fresh ones in, toss them out, like constantly, you know, learning the trade on on the road. And, and a lot of that started in Syria because the Syrian regime was was so incredibly adept at, uh, at spying on its people. But but again, like, you know, I mean, ha- hard for them to keep up. Well, of course. I mean, yeah, they're just to your point about the kind of the, the democratization of news, the democratization of tech is powering a lot of that as well. True. But to go on to something you mentioned there, is, you know, you mentioned the fact that, you know, you were the first one who was sent into that area. And there's a really good um, little piece today on journalism.co.uk, which uh, by Andrea Backhouse, who's a, um, a reporter who was living in Egypt when the Arab Spring broke. And yeah. she's talking about how you have to recognize that it's a hostile environment. There are significant dangers there, but she's talking about how you prioritize your mental health and where you find support. So I wonder through what you've seen, how has the thinking around that changed? Um, you know, I think it depends on on the news organization. It really depends on also the kind of work that people are doing. Mm. Uh, you know, when I first got in, certainly the industry is vastly less macho about mental health than it used to be. You know, there's not so much like grin and bear it and drink your way through and, you know, uh, sort of st- just stoicism alone is, is what you need. I think, I think that there's a real sense. I think there's a sense also now that we know more about it. We know mm. about how it kind of compounds, how it isn't really just one horrific incident. Um, and so there's much, much less stigma around journalists seeing therapists. It's, it should, I think, be a kind of, I think it should be compulsory, <laughs> you know, uh, just so that there isn't like a stigma of like, I'm going to see the therapist now. Um, you know, I need to tell HR or anything like that. Mm. I think that, that, that that's important. You know, when I, I remember being for the first time in my life being really shaken, like really, really traumatized from a story when I actually got out of Syria and I almost got caught and I was, I was very, very, very shaken. And it took weeks for that to dissipate, maybe months even. And, um, and, then, and I remember being very unsure of, of what I was experiencing, um, but turning to other journalists. And I think that, that that's really the key. Like we're all much better at talking to one another and providing that support to one another. And so I would say in terms of classic PTSD, treatment is better we're way better at recognizing it and help and supporting one another. I think one of the difficulties though, that is a more thorny issue and that journalists don't know what to do about is actually the issue of moral injury, which is more complex. There isn't really a, there isn't really a, there isn't a cure for moral injury. And we're still just trying to understand it. And the way I would describe it is, you know, PTSD is a kind of fear that sort of sticks in you. Uh, it's like a high alert that won't come down. And it's treatable. Moral injury is more like a broken heart, you know? And I think we don't understand that much about it. and We don't understand what to do about it. And I think it tends to compound over many decades of reporting on human suffering and injustice. Yeah. And I think that it's, a, you know, that's that's part that's one of the harder things is taking enough care of yourself to process sadness. I find that harder than processing fear. And I do think that's something that haunts a lot of journalists. I mean, it's a, it's one of those things that's a necessary evil of actually keeping the public informed. But at the sure. same time, the the public now is deluged with so yeah. much information that has grown exponentially. And there is such a marked disparity in trust. Yeah. Now, how does that actually impact the job of somebody whose role is to report accurately on 
conflict. On the one hand, you know, there is a democratization of, of truth, you mm-hmm. know, because, you know, the people and the places that we're reporting from don't need us 100%. They can just put it on online. You know, the problem is believability. You know, mm. it sucks to be called a liar. It really does. It sucks to tell people things they don't want to hear and watch them respond by saying, you're full of shit. And that, you know, it, it's really demoralizing, especially whenever you work very hard and risk your life to, 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 to do that story. So that sucks. I think a big part of it as well is it's a losing game to try to beat social media. You know, I think that's been happening in our industry for years now. We saw it with some of the terrible misinformation around the Boston bombing, you know, where, where people were in such a rush to be the first on social media to say um, to confirm lines, you know, I always say, especially when I was teaching my students, I'd say, you know, you might notice that, you know, the BBC, for better or for worse, are about 15 to 45 minutes after a mm. lot of other outlets. That's a good thing. Like those are a very busy, important 15 to 45 minutes. Um, so, you know, I don't know what to say, honestly, other than to just do good work, mm. put out quality work and and not get drawn into fights. There's so much noise on social media right now. If you can just put out quality information and if something is untrue, not get drawn into an argument about it, just say that is not correct. It's a lot easier for me because in many cases in those situations, I'm there. So it's yeah. easier for me to be like, well, actually, this is what's happening. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, just kind of behind you. Yeah. And if you don't believe me, it's probably because you don't want to. And there's well, only going to be so many yeah. people you can argue with. Yeah, 100%. I said in the, uh, we do a newsletter as well. And part of that, uh, I, I mentioned today that I feel like, based on that um, article on journalism.co.uk, that war reporting in a lot of ways brings all the struggles that journalism is having into stark focus because it is such a heightened version of it. You know, there is so much emotion involved. There is so much, uh, I suppose, confirmation bias that people want to see what they want to see. Mm. And that all seems to be exacerbated by the idea that in this kind of social media environment, you have to there are there's incentive to be first but actually yeah. the quality comes from you know the provenance of either you know to your lived experience having been there having built up this body of work where people can trust you or to the bbc's point of view where they say you know we might not be first there to it but you can guarantee that we will be the ones who are reporting on it yeah. as accurately as we possibly can does it come down to media literacy on the part of the public again that you know they have to learn almost who they can trust yes and i do think i i, I do think that that that's going to work. It's going to get worse before it gets better. What we're seeing now with, and this is more to do with the business model issue of news than, than anything else. Like as we see trusted brands decline and also, you know, I mean, part of that decline is that they cut to the bone when they need to cut costs and they cut reporters and then they, they're effectively damaging the quality of the work. So that's a death spiral loop. But as that happens, I do think that, you know, we will eventually see a rise in, you know, new groups of journalists or individuals who are trusted, you know, cooperatives of reporters. There will be quality re- reporting out there. And I am actually extremely optimistic that in the era of generative AI, where the Internet is going to be even more an ocean of total horseshit and (laughs) poor quality, quote unquote, information, you know, human reporting, a a human being who went to that hospital and got the death toll, who did that interview themselves, who took that photograph themselves, like going to the source of the input data is actually going to be the most valuable uh, thing there is. And so I'm not worried long term. I think that business, you know, that will be profitable. My worry is, you know, are people going to seek it out? Mm. You know, and that's, a, you know, that's as much a psychological issue as it is a business one, a media one, a political one. You know, do people, you know, do people want the confirmation bias? Um, I, I'm actually more hopeful now, having done a lot more research on what young people want. And I do think that you know, the Gen Zs and millennials are much, much, much more circumspect on what they're being told. They're actually deeply mistrustful. And, you know, and that's part of the problem for brands, but it is ultimately a good thing. And they don't like opinion. You know, the people, I'm sorry to say, I don't mean to be rude, but I think the people I fear most are like boomers on Facebook. (laughs) Um, You know, I I think that, that the youngsters are a bit more wily. So I'm hopeful 
that they will that they'll seek out more real information going forward. It's, see, it's really interesting you mentioned that the, the Reuters Digital News report they just, you know it came out what a couple of months ago now, and it was basically mm-hmm. saying young people, uh, Gen Z, typically trust individuals more than brands. You know, um, and I, yep. to what extent do you feel like that actually? feeds what you were saying that people are going to be more trustworthy of people who you know have got this provenance of really good reporting you know oh that is the future absolutely if you can connect with people um you know i mean i could bore you to death with the statistics i read that report i've read all of the reports um based on the project that i'm working on and young people are are actually more than twice as likely to pay for individuals than they offer mm-hmm. brands you know they and and it, and I, I i agree with you i think it it's part a culture that they grew up with watching influencers on social media. This is to them a much more normal and, and, and preferable marketplace of information. And they also have been raised with a certain degree of cynicism about the, about news organizations Mm. and corporations and companies, something that feels faceless to them. They want to know what's their agenda, you know, at least like, and they say this again and again in the research that They like individuals because they find them more trustworthy. Or if the individual has a bias, they feel as though there's an authenticity there and they know that there's a bias. They're not like, I am, I am reading you the news and I am the word of God and I am the truth. They are, they might be someone who's an activist, but they know that they're an activist. So I think they're looking for that transparency that individuals they believe can, can deliver. It's what you were saying before, democratization of information sources, you know? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm kind of, at times I'm, I'm torn on it because on the one mm. hand, you know, the old school journalist in me is like, well, you know, we're not meant to be, you know, we don't want to do identity journalism and we don't want to do uh, both sidesism and we don't want to do, you know, uh, well, this is my perspective and this is my perspective. You know, we're, it's supposed to be, you know, in an ideal world, this one reporter who goes in and lays out both perspectives. But I, I do think that increasingly we're at a point where there's a sense that, you know, getting both perspectives is is sometimes best done from people within those communities. Like, like I've had these debates around the Israel Gaza war right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, you know, is it fair to say a Gazan journalist can't say X, Y, and Z on their social media, or an Israeli journalist can't say X, Y, and Z? You know, and so I think we're all starting to have more honest conversations about, you know, where do we come from? What are we bringing to these stories? Are we you know, is it good, bad, or inevitable that we all have opinions and and um, and 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 you know, so you know, which is different from an axe to grind, you know, which is different from weaponizing your voice. So, yeah, you know, I think that you know, I just I just think it's it's a very complicated conversation, and I don't have a lot of the answers, but it's certainly one that young people are way more attuned to. It's going to be many years before I think anybody has grappled with it to the point where we can, you know, have a, a even any practical advice on this. But it's it's really really good to hear that you know things are shifting towards that way, at least from what you've seen. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I know the Media Voices listeners will really want to hear is obviously you've had a lot of lived experience reporting on things, and you know you now well you've been teaching for quite some time. What do you foresee as being some of the biggest skills required for journalists mm-hmm. who are coming up who might necessarily want to go into either conflict reporting or even reporting within those very well, the the emotive and the very difficult areas. Well, I would say, you know, the most important thing, and I think there's probably a lot of parents of, of uh, journalism students out there who would kill me for saying this, but I do think, you know, <laughs> if you're a, a foreigner um, getting over there and living in these regions, there's really no, there's really no um, substitute for coming like living there you know living I I lived in Yemen I lived in Afghanistan I lived in Dubai I lived in Mm -hmm. Beirut for six years um you know getting a sense of the place of where you're going to go and report from you really need to to sort of know it and and it's hard to put into words but you'll never really know it Mm -hmm. until you're in in a place you know and you're trying to pay your water bill and you're buying groceries and you're chatting to locals and you have neighbors and you make friends and you got to get under the skin of a place you know because otherwise you fly in you cover a crisis you don't cover a country or you don't cover a people you know um and and so I think that that's first and foremost. And that's really hard because a lot of young people are like, well, you know, the New York Times isn't going to hire me off the bat and fly me out to, to you know, Tokyo. Um, yeah. and, and so that's where freelancing, unfortunately, it becomes a necessary, you know, hardship. Um, mm-hmm. And that's sort of what I did. And, and, it, and it's, you know, it's all sleeping on a lot of sofas, eating a lot of street food. Um, but 
it, it's it's an extraordinary experience to, 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 and privilege to do. Um, so, you know, and beyond that, I mean, the obvious answer is, I would say, learn as broad a set of skills as you possibly can, but try to master one, you know, mm-hmm. like that, that's sort of, it's not possible to be the world's greatest photographer and videographer and editor and podcaster and on-camera person and writer. But if, you know, you do need to be able to manage with most of those skills, like, you know, three or four of those you really do need to be able to do to, to build a living and to, to be able to, to be able to, you know, find the work and be, be helpful, you know, uh, to, to a news organization. And, but, you know, find one thing that you absolutely love to do. That's really your speciality. I would say is, is probably the smartest thing to do. And the other thing I would say is, you know, when I was getting started, yes, I was in the middle East, but I recognized, you know, I had to sort of think like a business person, think like a self-employed person as a, as a freelancer, where I had to go where there was demand and not as much supply. So, you know, obviously this kiddo, 23, 24, all I wanted to do was to be on the glamorous, sexy stories in Baghdad and Kabul. And, you know, every news organization was like, thanks, honey. We've got <laughs> experienced journalists out there already and full of euros. Um, so a kind offer. So I ended up going off. So I would look at the map and be like, well, where are there important stories that I know editors kind of want, but not enough to send this big, you know, bells and whistles team to? They don't have a bureau there. So I started covering stories in Sudan and in Yemen. This is long before Yemen was ever in the news. Um, and so I would I would say, like, think a little bit outside the box on what you're pitching to editors. Don't just be like, well, I'd like to go to Ukraine and cover the war. You know, like, think of ways that you can be additive to their coverage. Um, and that's really, and all that is, is, is your foot in the door. And then you're, and then you're more than halfway there. So then for the listeners who are wondering, what would you, how do you describe your book, which was, it was out last year, right? My book is 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 a deeply raw and honest, um, bare bones account of what it's like to build a career in uh, TV journalism, you know, around the world, and, and in particular covering conflict. You know, I wanted to write. People said, "Why would you write a book?" You know, at age thirty eight. Why would you write a memoir? Age thirty eight. But but that's because I wanted to write a memoir about about trying to build a career, not about having some fabulously successful career. So there's a huge amount of the good, the bad, and the ugly in there. Um, a, a lot of a lot of of failures and trying to figure out ways around obstacles. Um, and so that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to write for, especially especially for young people who might be trying to figure out careers and say, look, you know, no one's career is this upward trajectory. And, you know, I grew up reading so many memoirs. I loved them. But they were always, they pretty much started at someone's, you know, super duper success days onwards. <laughs> so, so, so mine, my, my, my book is, is a lot more about the hard scrabble, you know, um, mm. takes in a lot of issues around class and journalism and, um, and a lot around, you know, the, the industry itself. I'm sure the listeners just heard me immediately start searching for that. So, yeah, fantastic. But, Jane, thank you so much. That's been fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful to be on. So, you know that that feeling when you walk into a room, I don't know, maybe the break room, the conference room, just the office in general, and people are talking about stuff that you know nothing about? (laughs) It's horrible, right? All, All too well. Well... If you got the Media Voices newsletter every day, top four stories, you'd be up to speed. You could actually be leading those conversations rather than stood there thinking, what the hell? And feeling really bad. So sign up for the Media Voices newsletter, voices.media, and feel better every day. Talking for newsletters, if you have a potentially award-winning newsletter, entries are now open for the Publisher Newsletter Award. <laughs> it's free to enter, um, as long as you are a publisher, uh, so you can go to publishernewsletters.com. Um, I think we're hoping to have an award ceremony in mid-July. Woo! Um, and if you're interested in making your newsletter better, we have the Publisher Newsletter Summit, which is being run as a stream alongside the Publisher Podcast Summit. It's a lot of publishers in the sentence. Uh, so you can book that by going to publisherpodcasts.com and there is a summit tab there and the agenda will be going live very soon. We have some very exciting workshops and things that I'm um, quite excited to share. <laughs> 
As to, can I just say 10 out of 10 for segueing this episode? That was a perfect right. segue. Yeah, it was well done. Oh, 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 those segues were amazing. It you set it up. It takes two to tango. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you so much for listening to this latest episode, the 280th episode of Media Voices. But for now, thank you so much for listening and a goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.